Part One. You will hear a student from overseas phoning the student accommodation office of a college in the UK for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four on page two. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. College Accommodation Bureau, Darren speaking. How may I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm starting at the college in September, and I need to find some accommodation. Right. Well, there are various options. The first one is to stay in college accommodation. That'd be a single room. How much would that cost? Well, it depends. For a standard room, you're looking at three thousand two hundred and seventy-six pounds for the year. That's just for a room with wash basin, or three thousand eight hundred and thirty-four pounds if you want an ensuite. That's with your own small bathroom. I see. That's more than I expected. It does include heating. That's quite a saving because energy costs can be high, especially in winter. Hmm. Does it include meals as well? No. All our rooms are self-catering now. There's a shared kitchen on each corridor where you can cook if you want to, or there are plenty of places to eat out on campus. Okay. And you said that's the price for the whole year. Well, you pay annually, but actually, it's for thirty-six weeks. It doesn't include holidays. You have to vacate the room then. Oh, um, I need somewhere to stay in the holidays. I can't afford to go home. The flights are too expensive. Well, there is another option. Several families who either work at the college or have children studying here offer visiting students a room in their homes. Oh. We call this arrangement home welcome, and we've still got a few places left at the moment. You pay a hundred and fifty pounds per week, and that includes breakfast, a packed lunch, and dinner, as well as heating. Is there a contract? Do you have to stay for the whole year? No, it's flexible. Um, it sounds really good, but I'm not sure. I really want to be a little more independent. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten on page two. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. What about finding somewhere to live off campus? Yes, you can rent a property in town privately. You might want to rent a room in a shared house. You'd have a room of your own and share the kitchen and bathroom with other students. What about if I don't want to share? You can get what we call a studio. They're often quite small, but they'll have everything you need. Right. How much would those two options cost? 
Well, prices vary depending on which part of town the property is in. Generally speaking, the cheapest is around two hundred and seventy-five pounds a month for each student. Oh, ah,、uh, that's not too bad. Yes, but it can also be as high as four hundred and ninety pounds, and then you'll have to pay all your other bills. What sort of amount would I be looking at for those? Well, last year students were paying on average about forty-three pounds per month each for gas and electricity. This year it'll probably be somewhere in the region of forty-eight pounds. That's a lot. Yes, they've gone up quite a bit, and on top of that, you have to pay for water, and that'll probably be around nine pounds. <sighs> That didn't occur to me, and I guess I'd have to pay for transportation too. That's right. Most of these properties are quite a long way from the college. Oh, it just gets worse and worse. What's the minimum contract on this type of accommodation? Six months, and you have to pay a deposit. But of course, you can stay there over the holidays. That's true. And you'd have to provide references. They want two from someone in this country. I see. That's not a problem. If you do choose this option, we can't find the property for you. You'd have to go through the estate agent, which manages the property for the owner. Right. Thanks. Well, I think I'd like to see what's available privately. Could you give me the estate agent details? That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear an audio guide introducing visitors to a museum. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen on page three. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Welcome to the Global Museum, located at the heart of this truly multicultural city, which is home to more than sixty different nationalities. The museum has a number of exciting displays and exhibitions, and this audio guide is designed to help you make the most of your visit. Altogether, the museum has eighteen different galleries. And this season sees the opening of three new exhibitions. We recommend that you begin your tour by visiting this season's highlights. The Heritage Clothes Exhibition is located in Gallery Five of the museum. People who live in the area have spent two years preparing this exhibition, which brings together some of the fascinating garments traditionally worn in their own communities. They research the history of their community's clothing traditions. 
and the customs and rituals associated with them. Altogether, 16 countries are represented, from Ghana to Korea, from Turkey to Nepal. The photographs that accompany each display case were taken by some of the city college students who are studying design and show the clothes being modelled by the real people who wear them in the course of their everyday lives. Another highlight this season is the exhibition called Toys from the Past, which can be found in Gallery 9. This exhibition, which will appeal to people of all ages, is on tour throughout the country and will be here for 10 weeks only. The exhibits include dolls made over a hundred years ago with beautiful porcelain faces and, in some cases, real hair. The collection covers the favourite toys such as wooden train sets from many different generations and provides plenty of interest for children and adults. The gigantic board games which are laid out on the gallery floor are one of the most popular activities in the exhibition and should not be missed. This exhibition concludes with a special display of miniature toys. These small objects are on loan from countries all over the world and in some cases measure no more than a few centimetres. There's a tiny car made from matchsticks, a toy aeroplane complete with pilot and passengers made out of seashells and some exquisite little buildings no higher than four centimetres. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20 on pages 3 and 4. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The final gallery highlight of the season is the Biscuit Gallery at number 15. Many years ago, this city was famous for its biscuits, although today the factory no longer exists. Did you know, for example, that before biscuits were packed in paper or cardboard boxes, biscuit tins were fashion items? The factory made tins, round, square, triangular, hexagonal, for a whole range of different occasions, to celebrate national events, festivals, famous faces and so on. One fascinating display deals with people's favourite biscuits. There are sweet biscuits and savoury ones, biscuits filled with jam and biscuits filled with currants, biscuits with pink, yellow and white sugar icing or coloured sugar flowers. When the factory finally closed, it announced that people's favourite biscuit was not, as you might expect, a chocolate biscuit, or one filled with jam and cream, but a plain, savoury one which was eaten with cheese. When you get to the end of the exhibition, there's an entertaining, hands-on activity to fill your own biscuit tin. All the biscuits ever produced by the company are piled up on a table along with various tins. The biscuits are made out of thin pieces of wood, but the weight, colours and shapes replicate the original biscuits. Your job is to fill a tin with biscuits so that when the lid is taken off, they sit there as neatly as they did when the job was done by machine. It's not as easy as it looks. If you would like to buy a memento of your visit, there is a museum gift shop selling postcards, souvenirs and handmade pottery next to the information desk on the ground floor. And finally, if you don't want to carry your coats and bags around with you during your visit, please make use of the free lockers provided by the museum. Enjoy your visit. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear a discussion between a student called Helen and her tutor about an assignment that Helen is working on. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24 on page 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Come in, Helen. How can I help you? Well, I'm doing research for the anthropology assignment, and I was hoping to check a few details. Sure. You chose the topic of Pacific Island tupper cloth, didn't you? What have you found out so far? Well... I was going to introduce my assignment by saying that the tupper cloth is a fabric made from bark, just the outer layer of the trees. It's particularly common in the Pacific Islands, but not exclusive to them. In fact, many other peoples around the world have made high-quality cloth from bark. But what sets Pacific tupper apart is the incredible variety of roles it's played in this region. Yes, nice introduction though I think you could be more specific regarding dates. OK, so what about the raw materials used? Well, tupper cloth is made from several species of tree. In the Pacific, the paper mulberry tree is most common, but it doesn't thrive in all conditions. In fact, it wasn't originally found in the islands, but was carried in their canoes by the first migrants. Tapa is also made from the breadfruit tree, which is convenient because its fruit is a staple food. The paper mulberry tree is only grown for tupper making, though. Yes, that's good. Now, what about the Maori people here in New Zealand? But the Maori don't make tupper now. That's right, and you need to account for it. We know that when Maori migrated here from the other Pacific Islands, they were prepared to make tupper because they brought the paper mulberry tree with them. The thing was, after they'd been in New Zealand a bit, they found the flax plant, which is superior to tupper because it makes a stronger fabric. By the time Europeans arrived in the 18th century, Māori were making all their fabric from flax and had been for some time. OK. So, with the production process itself, first did the inner bark is beaten with wooden hammers to soften the fibres. Then the different pieces are glued together using an adhesive paste made from the arrowroot tuber. This is the only way to fabricate large pieces of cloth because bark strands are too fine to be woven together and stitching isn't strong enough. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30 on page 6. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So now you need details about different countries. Where would you start? I think Samoa is the obvious place. It's famous for its very fine cloth called Siapo, which is hand-painted with representations of the ancestors. Still today, at the most profound events in life, such as births, funerals, weddings, and the investiture of chiefs, Samoans wear siapo robes to add significance and meaning to the ceremony. OK. Then I could talk about Tonga. It seems to me that the great innovation in Tonga has been developing a simple, 
coarse cloth, which is quick and easy to make. This is suitable for all sorts of everyday functions around the house, like bed covers, mosquito nets and curtains. Good point. Now, what about Cook Island's tapa? Well, the soil there is poor quality, so the breadfruit tree is often used. One type of thick cloth called tikoru was wrapped around the poles and used to mark the entrances to places of worship, so it was highly regarded in local culture. You might mention Fiji as well, which is interesting because tapa was actually used as a currency there. Fijians used to sail between the islands and exchange tapa for other commodities like canoes or pigs. I know that in Tahiti the tapa cloth is different because the patterns are in colour, which is considered more valuable than the usual brown patterns. You're right about the Tahitians using coloured pigments, but they aren't more valuable. The colours are only a decoration. People enjoy wearing bright robes, especially for dancing and competitive games. And do it just for fun. Oh, I'll make a note of that. Well, the last place I was going to mention was Tikopia. Even today, it's commonplace to see people wearing clothes made of tapa cloth. In many of the other islands, the tapa only comes out on special occasions. But here, you see people working in the gardens wearing tapa. Sounds promising, Helen. I'll look forward to reading your assignment. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a talk about research into learner persistence given by a university lecturer to her colleagues. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 7 and 8. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My talk is about a research study I did over a period of five years on learner persistence, why some people stick at academic study better than others. As teachers, you will know that there is a tremendous variation in the learner's response to certain things. For example, a short period of illness might completely destabilize some students and cause them to give up their degree studies. Other learners might overcome tremendous difficulties to stay the course. I am particularly interested in this second group, who are the ones with learner persistence. What I decided to do was design a research study using a sample of my university's third-year undergraduate students. 295 in all, who obviously had already stayed the course pretty well. The sample was drawn from a range of ages, but there was deliberately a significant number of mature students, and all respondents were living at home in the local region. I wanted to have this element of consistency, not having some coming from outside the area and living in university accommodation. 
It should be noted, though, that there was significant variation in home background to reflect the variation in our student population. I designed questionnaires, which were devised to elicit what their concerns had been as they started the course, and what had sustained them throughout the three years. Findings from the first section indicated that their worries when they started varied from financial concerns, though this had not been as strong as I expected, to career prospects. But mature students with children tended to emphasize uncertainties about their relationship with them. The second section of my questionnaire looked at learner persistence under three main headings, social and environmental factors, other factors, and intrinsic or personal characteristics. I identified three levels of importance for each of these. At the first level, those points identified by participants as most important in learner persistence. For social factors, many respondents said how crucial it had been to have good support, though there was no one specific source. It could be family or friends. As regards other factors, students are heartened not so much by high grades, but by what they regard as success in study. And for personal characteristics, many respondents reported that they took pleasure in challenge and that this was regarded as very significant. At the second level of importance, in the first category, a sizable percentage talked about the fact that they had enjoyed themselves in school as an important social factor. In the second column, other factors, a number of people said that what was of most importance was decent health. This had a fairly strong influence on their persistence in their studies. And then under the heading of personal characteristics, there were quite a large percentage of respondents who mentioned they felt it was important to have lots of interests in their everyday lives. This gave them a depth and sense of perspective, which less persistent learners might lack. And then on to the third level. Under social factors, several respondents talked about good relationships with their tutors. For other factors, they mentioned lack or absence of any problems in their families. And finally, under column three, they identified an ability to juggle several roles, what we might call their capacity for multitasking. Now, these findings obviously helped inform the design of activities, as I mentioned. But in addition, a number of further recommendations emerged. Firstly, I propose that the department distributes questionnaires to first-year students to help get an idea of their maturity when starting the course. This is really our overriding concern. Secondly, I recommend we look into ways of offering induction courses for some selected students to allow them to take on the role of advisors. We think they are the best people to act in that role. This policy will make support much more accessible to our students. Thirdly, this help is often most needed in the evening and night when offices are closed, and so we should set up online services instead of the more traditional telephone services. Research has shown that these services are actually more accessible to the majority of students. And finally, it is often important to be proactive. If students are not meeting deadlines, then someone should contact them rather than wait for them to come to us. Now, are there any questions about the points... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Hey there, IELTS warriors. Ready to conquer the reading section? Today, I'm diving deep into the heading section hacks that'll boost your score and save you precious time. First up, skim through the entire passage. Don't read every word, just get the gist. Look out for keywords and phrases that stick out. These are usually found in the first and last sentences of each paragraph. They often hold the essence of the text. Next, glance at the list of headings. Notice any keywords or phrases that match up with your initial skimming? Great! But here's a pro tip. Don't lock in your answer just yet. Trick number three. Match the meaning, not the words. Sometimes the headings use synonyms or paraphrased ideas. So think about what the paragraph is truly about, not just the words they use. Another tip. Watch out for distractors. Some headings might seem like they fit, but they only cover a small part of the paragraph. The right heading will encompass the main idea of the whole paragraph. Now practice makes perfect. Take past papers and time yourself. The more you practice, the quicker you'll get at identifying the main ideas and matching them to the correct headings. Lastly, stay calm. Remember, the heading section is all about understanding the main ideas. If you've prepared well, you've got this. So there you have it. Skim, match meanings, avoid distractors, and practice. Smash that like button if you found these tips helpful, and don't forget to subscribe for more IELTS hacks. Best of luck, and see you in the next video.